All right, folks, now let's discuss the different groups of minerals, and I'm going to start here by discussing the silicate minerals, but uh, first of all, let's look at some of the kind of major groups of minerals here, right? And again, like I mentioned before, you know, the most common minerals are going to be made up of the most common elements of Earth, right? Oxygen and silicon being the two highest, right? Aluminum, iron, potassium, magnesium, these kind of guys, right? Uh, minerals are then classified uh, based on their chemistry of their anion or their ionic groups, right? So we have kind of several important ones here. First, we have the O plus a metallic element. So this is our oxide mineral group. So an O plus, you know, an iron is an iron oxide group, right? So when we attach oxygens to irons, we make our, our iron oxides, right? Um, any uh, uh, sulfur plus a metallic element is going to be our sulfide group. So we can have, you know, a copper sulfide or something like that or a, a lead sulfide, right? Uh, and these are going to be common ore minerals. Both the oxide and the sulfides are, are common ore minerals for us. Uh, then there's minerals that have an anion group called the carbonate anion. That's uh, Ca uh, carbon and then oxygen, right? It's a, a, a carbonate ion, right? Uh, these are a carbonate group and these will often fizz in acid. And then we have a group of minerals that has an anion group SiO4. This is silicon and four oxygens, right? This is the silicate group and that's the one we're going to start with uh, talking about in this video, right? The silicate group is by far the most common and the most important group of minerals that we have on our planet, right? They're, they're very common rock forming minerals uh, made of silicon, again, and oxygen with or without metallic elements bonded to them. Uh, usually they do, but this example here, quartz, is just pure silicon and oxygen, right? Uh, it is also important to note that most of our, the vast majority of our uh, uh, silicate minerals form out of molten rock. They crystallize uh, out of magma uh, as it starts to cool. And that is how we form many of our silicate minerals, right? So let's take a really close look at the silicate group. This is going to be a very important group of minerals uh, all around the planet, right? The basic building block of the silicate group is the silica tetrahedron, right? Tetrahedron is a four-sided pyramid, so we have one silica atom in the middle, remember it's SiO4, surrounded by four oxygen atoms, right? So one silica atom with four oxygen atoms surrounding it, right? And these are just kind of two different views, this kind of uh, exploded view, if you will, so it shows you the bonds between those, right? And these silicon and oxygen bonds, these are, these are very strong bonds, as I mentioned when we talked about um, um, cleavage, right? Uh, often these are, are the strongest bonds, so these are between the cleavage planes, right? Um, so we start with just the very basic, right? Uh, SiO4 silica tetrahedron, right? And this tetrahedron uh, can be linked to, you know, like a, an iron or a magnesium to make a, a mineral called an olivine. And that is one of the simplest of our silicate minerals, right? Uh, however, as the magma starts to cool, so when, when things are really hot, right, uh, uh, everything is disordered, there are no, 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 uh, no bonds, right? All the elements are moving around really fast. That's what temperature is, is, is fast vibration, right? But as they start to cool down, we can start to form these bonds, right? So we start to form these silica tetrahedra. But as it starts to cool down further and further, we can join these tetrahedra together in more and more complex varieties of structures, right? So for example, we can go from what we call these isolated tetrahedra, right? Which would be just single tetrahedra uh, with, you know, a metal attached to it, right? To these single chains, right? Uh, and so here, look, here's a one tetrahedron, right? We have the, the one silica in the middle and then the one, two, three, four oxygen atoms surrounding it, right? But now look at this adjacent tetrahedron here, right? He also has one silicate, one, two, three, four oxygens, but notice this oxygen is common or shared by both tetrahedron, right? So now, right, we are sharing this one, right? And then 
look at this one again, same thing, right? One silica and one, two, three, four oxygen, but this oxygen being shared between right adjacent tetrahedra so the sharing of those oxygens together linking these tetrahedra uh, can create a variety of these complex structures and actually changes the chemical formula I mean they're still based on these SiO4 tetrahedron right but now instead of being SiO4 we have more something like SiO3 because the ratio right now because we're sharing some of those oxygens we have less oxygen per silica right so the ratio is, is dropping right so here is kind of a classification chart looking at some of those different structures that we can get in the silicas right and at, as I mentioned right these start to form more and more complex structures as that magma starts to cool down so generally uh, we're talking up here being the highest temperatures right olivine being one of the first minerals to crystallize out right then notice you have those single tetrahedron with a magnesium or an iron you know a couple of those attached to it right now Next, as we start to cool down, we form a more complex framework, right? Uh, we have single chains, right? So again, this silica atom is, or this oxygen atom is being is shared by uh, tetrahedron one and tetrahedron two, right? This uh, oxygen atom is being shared by tetrahedron two and tetrahedron three, right? And so on and so on, right? Uh, and this drops our ratio. I mean, basically, we still have tetrahedron, but it drops our ratio to more like, you know, three oxygens per one silica instead of four oxygens per one silica, right? And magnesium and iron. And these are, are, uh, are, what, are what make our peroxine groups, right? Uh, often cleavage-wise, we see these uh, as, as two planes at right angles, right? So that's our, our, our um, prismatic right angle, prismatic, right? Now, cooling things down even more, we can get even more complex. Now, we can take these single chains, right, and attach one single chain to another single chain, right? And look, now we're, we're sharing these oxygens between adjacent chains even, right? Same thing would occur down here, right? So, so this is, you know, uh, an even more complex, takes a little bit, you know, cooler temperatures to start to form these. We see these double chains in our amphibole group, most common amphibole minerals, hornblende, right? And again, look, our ratio is dropping, but now it's a really crazy ratio, like 22 oxygens to eight silica, right? Don't worry about that so much. But uh, our, notice our ratio of oxygen is still dropping, right? Or, or inversely, we can say, the ratio of silica is going up relative to oxygen, right? So we have more silica in this per oxygen, right? So, or less oxygen per silica, right? Um, either way you want to say that. Then, getting even a little more complex, we have our sheet silicates, right? So now we take these double chains and we join the double chains together, right? And in between those double chains, now look, we're sharing, again, more oxygens, right? So now we're at, you know, something like, oh, what is that, O10, uh, silicon 3, O10, right? So again, that ratio is still, right, less oxygen per silica or more silica per oxygen, however you want to say that, right? Uh, these are our mica minerals, our biotites and our muscovites. These are the ones that peel into sheets, right? Isn't that convenient? Our sheet silicates peel into sheets, right? That happens to be very very useful right and then down here at the bottom forming our, our coolest temperatures right it takes the lowest temperatures in that magma before you can start to you know form uh these very complex what we call framework silicates or you know very complex three-dimensional network silicates right uh, and those consist of our feldspars right and again feldspars are going to have uh um that um uh um prismatic cleavage at just about 90 degrees it's right about 89 or something like that right but uh anyway and then uh getting down here so we have now 08 you know eight oxygen per three silica right so that's even you know more, more silica per oxygen or ratio of silica to oxygen is going up right the oxygen is going down per silica and then we get to quartz right quartz is completely silica and oxygen there's no metals in there at all right so these silicon oxygen bonds these are all strong they have no cleavage it has fracture um but uh, notice here we are at 
one silica per two oxygen. So effectively, from olivine, we have one silica per four oxygen. By the time we get down to crystallizing quartz out, we have one silica per two oxygen, effectively doubling the ratio of silica to oxygen between olivine and as a you know we go down and, and cool down to quartz right olivine or quartz being olivine being the highest temperature you know uh, simplest form quartz being the lowest temperature most complex forms right so let's look at these kind of individually here again uh, these isolated tetrahedra like olivine here right olivine is olive green it's one of the minerals that color does work with right if it's a gem variety like this it's called peridot i'm an august birthday peridot is my birth gemstone and i think it is the ugliest color of green on the planet uh but either way whatever right so again uh sio4 is the root of their chemical formula right as this sil silica tetrahedron is the root of all silicate minerals right getting a little more complex those single chains right so those tetrahedra right sio3 is now the root of their chemical formula right three oxygens per one silica and again you know we still see those tetrahedra but they're sharing more oxygen right those double chain silicates right these are going to be our amphibole minerals such as hornblende here which often looks kind of like burnt wood you can kind of see that there right these double chains again single chains that are you know now sharing tetrahedra between those two single chains right as we're cooling down through this whole process right sheet silicates right now these tetrahedra double chains are linked together into sheets right a network of sheets right these make our, our uh, uh, sheet silicate minerals like our micas that peel into sheets conveniently and then our framework silicates right uh the tetrahedra now linked so it's you know tightly together there in what's basically a three-dimensional framework right sio2 is the root of the chemical formula for quartz right so now we've gone from olivine SiO4 to quartz SiO2, effectively doubling the ratio of silicon to oxygen, right, as these crystallize out, right? Let's take another look at this, right? So moving down the silicate structure list, right? Things become more ordered, as we see, right? More complicated. This, of course, takes more time to form, right? For a couple of reasons, it's got to cool down slowly in our earth, right? In these big magma chambers, right? As this cools down, right? These, these more complex structures form, but they themselves take longer to form, right? And again, more and more oxygen atoms shared between these silica uh, tetrahedra, right? Is increasing that rate, ratio of silica to oxygen, right? So, the minerals up at the top here olivine right we call these low silica content minerals right one silica per four oxygen whereas quartz which are going to be our framework silicate right high silica content one silica per two oxygen effectively doubling that silicon to oxygen ratio right so Again, to fill off many of these structures, those tetrahedra need to combine with some uh, some uh, cations to produce you know, electrically neutral compounds. What are these common cations? Well, let's see. Uh, iron, yep. Magnesium, yep. Potassium, mm-hmm. Sodium, right on. Aluminum, right. And then calcium, right. Six of our eight most common elements on our planet. Where are the other two? Well, they're the silica and the oxygen making up the silicate tetrahedra right so our most common minerals are our most common bonding you know uh cations of course right so to summarize right basic framework of a silicate we have the tetrahedron right this one single silica atom surrounded by four oxygen atoms right these can then join together or link together in a variety of, of forms to create complex silicate structures right the more complex structures take cooler temperatures and longer times to form right uh silica structures that are then linked by positively charged atoms or cations unless you're quartz and then you're just pure silica and oxygen right and again there's our some of our friends right again our, our eight most common elements on the planet right? now 
let's take a look at between the you know relationship between the internal structures of these silicate minerals and the cleavage right so in these silicate minerals like I mentioned when we were talking about cleavage right uh, the silicate oxygen bonds are the strongest right generally uh, the cleaving happens between these planes the between these different silicate structures so for example in in the micas of the sheet silicates they, they cleave between the sheets of, of silica tetrahedra right Again, minerals tend to cleave between these silicate structures rather than across them, right? Or if you've got this guy quartz here, right? He's only silica and oxygen, right? Those are all strong bonds. There is no weak direction, so you won't get cleavage. You'll get fracture, right? You'll get this conchoidal fracture, right? Now, there are two main kind of divisions within our silicate minerals, right? And it is important to, to note that most of these minerals have structures, right? Uh, and the chemical compositions, as we looked at, you know, the, how they work in that chart, right? Uh, that reflect the conditions under which they form, especially temperature, right? And pressure, right? So uh, we saw in, in that uh, silicate tetrahedron, you know, this, the, the silicate structure chart, right? How it gets more and more complex as things cool down, right? Um, so we, uh, we generally divide the silicate minerals into two major groups uh, uh, and this is kind of based on these these chemical structures right and and how they form the dark group of minerals also known as the ferro magnesian right ferro being an old old Greek word for iron ferric right so iron and magnesium from magnesium so these are iron and magnesium rich minerals which makes them darker but as we found out when we talked plate tectonics, also makes them denser, right? And then we have the light or non ferromagnesian silicates, not saying there isn't any iron or magnesium in them, just saying it's much, much less than in uh, these, uh, these uh, the ferromagnesian minerals, right? So let's look at these ferromagnesian silicates again, iron and magnesium rich silicates, right? They have, again, magnesium and or iron in their structures, right? This makes them darker in color. And when we're talking dark colors for, for, for minerals, we're talking uh, blacks, browns, and greens, right? Greens are a dark color when it comes to minerals, right? Being olivine being one of our highest temperature minerals and highest iron and magnesium content minerals out there, right? These also generally have a greater specific gravity. Why? Well, because of the extra iron and magnesium in their in their structures, right? Those are dense elements. So here's our olivine again, very high temperature, right? Black to green in color, glassy luster, right? No cleavage, just conchoidal fracture. Often you'll see them stuck together. They'll look like, you know, a, a thing of green sandstone, right? Or a bunch of little green sands, right? These are our black and green sand uh, beaches in Hawaii. Uh, there's a lot of olivine out there, right? So again, olivine is olive green. It's one of the few that color often really works on, right? Then we have peroxines, right? Augite is a very common variety of peroxine, right? This is going to be uh, dark green to black. If you look at it, it, almost has kind of sometimes a very a greenish hue even to it, right? Um, it's got two directions of cleavage on it, right? This, however, is not a, um, when we're talking about the luster, this is not a metallic mineral. This is not a metallic luster. This is um, still a, a, um, uh, a, uh, a transparent, if you put it in the, the thinnest, uh, you know, slicing it on a microscope, basically, right? Um, but our, our, uh, our peroxine groups will have uh, two directions of cleavage, so our, our prismatic cleavage at 90 degrees to each other. You can see that kind of echoed in this rock, right? And then our ferromagnesian silicate horn blend, which is an amphibole. Horn blend is a very common amphibole. Uh, these are going to be dark green to, to, to black. Usually they're, they're more black. Uh, they look kind of opaque, but again, this is not a metallic mineral. Metallic minerals, you really got to look like they would, you know, conduct electricity, basically, right? Uh, these have two cleavage planes, but instead of being, you know, the, the prismatic at uh, um, 90, they're at, you know, 60 and 120, making more of a diamond 
shape structure. Uh, Hornblende to me often in hand sample often has kind of a very burnt woody look to it as well, right? All right, and then our sheet silicates, right? So we went through our, our uh, peroxine. So here's our single chain, or I'm sorry, isolated tetrahedra, single chain peroxine, double chain amphibole, right? And then our sheet silicates, our micas, right? Our, uh, our ferromagnesian version, right? Iron and magnesium rich version uh, is called biotite, biotite black, right? This is in the mica family, right? Again, these, these sheet silicates, uh, conveniently peel into little sheets as you can see here right uh, this can look black or very dark brown but as you can see right this is also not metallic because you can see through it on some of the thinnest of the the, 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 the little peelings here right you can actually look through them right and then we have our light or non ferromagnesian silicates right and these tend to be more of our uh, well, sheet and framework silicates, right? So, again, light means lighter in color. And when we're talking light colors for silicate minerals, we're talking whites, clear, pinks, reds, oranges, uh, even dark reds, and blues. These are light colors, so reds and blues and pinks and 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 and, uh, and clears and whites. These are often uh, non-ferromagnesian silicates, right? They are lower in specific gravity because they have less of that iron and magnesium in their structure, right? And they have generally more more calcium, more aluminum, more potassium, and sodium as as those metallic bonding agents, uh, rather over over uh, iron and magnesium, right? So here is uh, one of our non-ferromagnesian silicates, potassium feldspar, right? Uh, this can be uh, also known as orthoclase uh, or microcline. Uh, this is often uh, has a very uh, uh, kind of uh, pink or, or, or salmon color to it, but we can get this really cool aqua color as well in it, right? It has these very thin little wavy lines that are what are known as exolution lamellae. Right, and this is as it forms some, you know, a little bit different chemistry forms in these these kind of little wavy lines, right? But uh, as 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 the mineral kind of crystallizes, uh, but that is uh, kind of in contrast to our plagioclase feldspar, which usually is somewhere between white and gray, right? Two directions of cleavage, just like the uh, the potassium feldspar, but it has striations. It has these very little dead, perfect thin parallel lines if you look at your fingernail and turn it just right in the light you'll see dead little you know thin parallel lines you'll see the same thing in a good piece of plagioclase feldspar right? and then we have quartz right consisting consisting entirely of the silicon and oxygen bonds all direct you know that's that's all pretty strong bonds there's no weak direction so it has no cleavage it's got conchoidal fracture right but when you see it in in crystal form right this crystal form you have often forms these these beautiful pyramid shaped ends or double pyramid shaped ends sometimes right and again here we have our, our clear form amethyst is the is the purple form uh, then we have citrine as the orange smoky quartz is the, the but you know notice how many color varieties there are right so color not very helpful on this mineral right but the uh, other properties of it you know hardness of seven and and these these double pier or these beautiful little pyramids often can help tell you that you're dealing with quartz right uh chalcedony or chert uh form sometimes this can is one of the few uh non ferromagnesian or one of the few silicate minerals that can form as a sedimentary rock rather than out of igneous rock um uh but again it's it's you know basically just pure quartz sio2 but we call it microcrystalline quartz as little microscopic crystals of it uh but same properties conchoidal fracture hardness of seven that jazz right we also have some uh, sheet silicate minerals that live in our non-ferromagnesian uh, realm, right? So here's muscovite. It's our light version. So biotite was the black version, right? Biotite black, muscovite white, right? Uh, so this is, again, our, our mica family, and this is the sheet silicates. And guess what? Pulls perfectly in these beautiful little sheets, right? Again, you can see through them. They're, they're transparent, right? They're going to be clear to kind of a, you know, almost even maybe a lightish green color uh, sometimes in them, right? 
And then there's a few uh, other ones, right? Kaolinite, this is a clay mineral, soft white chalky appearance. Uh, and uh, very important, we use that in a lot of uh, base for uh, 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 ma uh, makeups and, and paints and stuff like that because it's such a pure white. You can then take that and make sure you get an even, you know, finished product, right? Uh, talc is also a sheet silicate. Again, you can almost feel, you can almost see how greasy this thing feels, right? And of course, this is where we get talcum powder. So again, like I said, temperature formation is very important to these, right? The lighter colored silicate minerals, right? Quartz, feldspars tend to form at our lower temperatures. And that makes sense because they have those more complex structures, right? Framework and, and, uh, and sheet silicate, right? While our darker colored ferromagnesian silicates like olivine, peroxines, amphiboles, biotite, right? These are all forming at our very at very high temperatures, right? All of these in crystal all of these crystallizing out at well over a thousand degrees centigrade, right? So, right, darker colored, higher temperature, denser, right? Lighter colored, lower temperature, right? Less dense. And here's that kind of put all together uh, into what's known as Bowen's reaction series. So here we see uh, kind of the minerals that we've been talking about, right? Uh, and here we see temperature, right? High temperature, right? At the very highest temperature, we have no minerals. It's all just liquid, right? But as we start to cool off, we start to crystallize more and more complex structures, right? Uh, and these, as we when we move into the next uh, uh, chapter on on uh, igneous rocks, we'll start to associate these words, right? So here's our ferromagnesian ones, right? These are the ferromagnesian versions, and these are the non-ferromagnesian, right? Uh, we'll talk about the feldspar in just a second here. But so we have our our, our framework and and uh, sheet silicates here, right? Our generally lo generally lower temperature, right? And our uh, so our, our non-ferromagnesian, and then our higher temperature ferromagnesian. We will also relate these words mafic to the ferromagnesian rocks that have lots of these or the mineral or the rocks that have lots of these ferromagnesian minerals in them so you can often call you can call these ferromagnesian minerals or you can call these mafic minerals right felsic on the other hand we're going to relate it to rocks that are composed mostly of non-ferromagnesian minerals right so you can call non-ferromagnesian minerals also felsic minerals right now there's an intermediate part we'll get to talking about that later right but so we have two kind of series here that kind of form a y or branch if you will right um and as we cool down things change a little bit right so this is our discontinuous series of crystallization that we talked about right first you start to te uh, highest temperatures olivine isolated tetrahedra right start to cool things down we can form those single chain peroxines cool things down even more now we can form those more complex double chain amphiboles and then finally those sheet silicates right and then we can uh, then form as we drop even cooler and cooler, right? The last to crystallize are our, our non-ferromagnesian, right? More complex framework structures, right? So what's going on with this guy over here, right? This is our plagioclase feldspar, right? So here we have our orthoclase or potassium feldspar. Here we have our plagioclase feldspar. And this is called this continuous series of crystallization because plagioclase, right, kind of unlike what we've been talking about actually can form at even some of the highest temperatures right and even though it is a framework mineral right but that's going to have more calcium in its structure at those higher temperatures and as it cools down it's going to change to having more and more sodium and less and less calcium in its structure right but it's kind of a continuum or a gradient if you will between the uh calcium rich ones and the sodium rich ones right calcium rich at high temperatures sodium rich at low temperatures right all right, folks, that ends it for this video.